Good afternoon. Before we start Chapter 28, Concepts of Care for Patients with Infectious Respiratory Problems, I wanted to review some similarities w between wet and dry suction and also some distinguishing differences between the two systems. With um, both wet and dry chest tube um, systems, you will have marked um, drainage collection chambers. They will collect, again, as we discussed in lecture, fluid or blood that you can then mark on that system to indicate how much drainage has been occurring per hour during um, your shift. Both systems will also have water sealed chambers where we can monitor for air leaks. In the water sealed chamber, you want to have a minimum of two centimeters of water to maintain the water seal. Now we will talk about some differences in the system. So for dry suction, as the word dry implies, you do not have water for this system. You will utilize the dial to apply your prescribed suction from your provider. Most common is negative 20 millimeters of mercury. When connected to suction, you will see an orange bellow that will inflate to indicate that suction is working. With wet suction, we utilize water um, in the suction chamber to determine the amount of suction supplied. The most common height is 20 centimeters of H2O. Now when this is attached to suction, you will see gentle continuous bubbling in the suction control chamber. If this bubbling is not present, it is important to assess your system to make sure um, that suction is on or there may be a leak present. Now nursing management of wet or dry um, systems, you want to keep that system um, either one below the patient's chest. You want to make sure the tubing is free of kinks and dependent loops. And you want to continue to monitor drainage for color and amount. You may see fluctuations um, up and down within the water seal chamber. That's called tidling. It's occurring with inhalation and exhalation. If you do not see tidling, the lung may have re-expanded or there may be a kink in the system that you need to assess for. You may also have intermittent bubbling in the water seal chamber. This may represent air that's being removed from the pleural space in a pneumothorax. This removal of air usually occurs just with intermittent bubbling due to coughing, sneezing, or position changes. If you have excessive or continuous bubbling in the water seal chamber, you would need to assess for an air leak within your system. You also want to monitor the patient's respiratory status. Um, note skin around the insertion side of the chest tube for any subcutaneous crepitus. If your chest tube was to become dislodged, it would be important for you to cover the site with a sterile dressing and tape three sides um, prior to notifying the provider of the dislodgement. If your system breaks, you want to insert the distal end of the chest tube into one centimeter of sterile water or sterile normal saline. Um, that's to maintain your water seal and then you will acquire a new system for setup. Do remember to, rem to review um, the chest tube management box on page 561 of your textbook. Seasonal influenza is a highly contagious acute viral respiratory infection. Symptoms include rapid onset of headache, muscle ache, fever, chills, fatigue, and weakness. It is preventable, or at least the severity can be significantly reduced with vaccination. Um, the vaccination includes um, strands of antigens for three or four um, virus strands that are expected to be prevalent in that particular season. The complications of seasonal influenza including pneumonia or death are more commonly occur in older adults, those with chronic conditions such as heart failure or lung disorders and our patients who are immunocompromised. Outside of these um, exceptions, most patients are treated at home, but those with these complications or immunocompromised states may need hospitalizations to help manage their symptoms due to the severity and the concern for complications such as pneumonia. The recommended flu vaccine um, is administered as an IM injection. There is um, a formulation of the vaccine that's available for older adults, 65 or older. 
it is a higher dose equivalent vaccine. You would want to teach your patient who is sick to reduce the risk for spreading the flu by thoroughly washing their hands, especially after nose blowing, sneezing, coughing, or rubbing their eyes, or touching their face. Other precautions include staying home from work, school, and avoiding crowds, covering their mouth and nose with a tissue when sneezing or coughing. The rapid influenza diagnostic test is common um, in many outpatient acute clinics, but it does have a high false negative rate. Um, therefore, most patients will um, proceed with antiviral treatment if they're symptomatic, even if their rapid influenza test is negative. These antivirals are most effective if started within the first 24 to 48 hours of symptom onset. So you wanna encourage patients if they believe they have the flu or have been exposed um, to be tested. Instruct the patient, of course, to focus on rest for several days, increasing their fluid intake to avoid dehydration. A pandemic respiratory virus infection is one that has the potential to spread globally. Um, one that we are most familiar with is COVID-19. Some patients who develop COVID-19 are asymptomatic or experience minimal symptoms. Other experience minor respiratory symptoms similar to a common cold and recover with no apparent long-term effects. Others though, particularly those older adults and individuals with pre-existing chronic conditions, can develop viral pneumonia that can lead to severe acute respiratory distress syndrome and we'll talk about that in more detail in the next chapter. You do want to see the key features of COVID-19 um, for symptoms that's associated with this infection. These um, symptoms usually are present for 2 to 14 days. You can see the key features box on page 568 of your textbook. Pneumonia is excessive fluid in the lungs. This begins with inflammation, which is the syndrome of normal tissue responding to cellular injury, allergy, or the invasion of pathogens. Um, this inflammation will occur in interstitial spaces, the alveoli themselves, and the bronchioles. This begins with the pathogens penetrating the airway mucosa and multiplying in the alveolar spaces. Our immune system then responds as by sending white blood cells into the area of infection. This is going to lead to a leakage of capillary fluid. Edema will also form. These events um, significantly reduce gas exchange by interfering with the diffusion um, in the lungs. If these organisms move into the bloodstream, complications include sepsis, but also the possibility of a collection of pus within the pleural cavity itself. Over time, the fibrin and edema stiffen the lungs, resulting in decreased compliance and reducing the vital capacity of the lungs. You also have complications of alveolar collapse or atelectasis, which is going to reduce gas exchange even further by reducing the number of healthy alveolar that can participate in gas exchange, therefore leading to hypoxemia. Table 28.1 on page 570 of your textbook compares community acquired pneumonia and healthcare acquired pneumonia. Non infectious causes of pneumonia include inhalation of toxic gases, chemical fuses, and smoke, but also um, includes aspiration of water, food, and fluid. Infectious pneumonia can be further categorized into community acquired pneumonia, hospital acquired pneumonia, healthcare acquired pneumonia, or ventilator associated pneumonia. And we'll talk about um, ventilator associated pneumonia in chapter 29. Pneumonia health promotion and maintenance. You should review the box on page 571 in your textbook for preventing pneumonia. Prevention strategies include vaccination. There are national patient safety goals set by the Joint Commission that recognize, recommend that nurses especially encourage older adults um, who are 65 or older or those with chronic health conditions to receive immunization against pneumonia. 
for inpatients admitted for any condition. The Joint Commission also recommends checking the pneumonia vaccine status of your patient and, if needed, offering the vaccine during the inpatient stay. Additional strategies, strategies include avoiding crowded places during flu season, encouraging your patient to cough, turn, move, deep breathe, and utilize their incentive spirometer, being vigilant with cleaning respiratory equipment, smoking sensation, ensuring adequate rest and sleep, eating a healthy diet, and maintaining adequate hydration. Pneumonia assessment, recognizing cues. Many patients with pneumonia will have flushed cheeks and appear anxious. They may report chest pain or discomfort, headache, chills, fever, cough, may have tachycardia, shortness of breath, produce bloody sputum, and report increased sputum production. They may experience severe chest muscle weakness due to the repetitive and sustained coughing. You would want to observe your patient's breathing pattern and their position. And remember to prioritize your patients who are demonstrating respiratory distress with tripod positioning and use of accessory muscles. You want to assess their cough for the also amount, color, and consistency of their sputum assessing their lungs for the presence of crackles, wheezing, or bronchial breath sounds. A patient with pneumonia, especially an older adult, is often hypotensive and will experience orthostatic changes, um, and this is due to the vasodilation and also dehydration that is present usually with pneumonia. Your patient will have a rapid, weak, thready pulse. Um, which also could indicate hypoxemia, dehydration, and also be signs of um, complications of pneumonia, including shock and sepsis. Dysrhythmias may also occur, and this is due to the cardiac tissue not receiving the oxygen it needs to function properly. You do want to be familiar with common pneumonia signs and symptoms and their causes that are listed in Table 28. Point three on page 572. I do want to bring your attention to the older adult consideration box on 573. As the older adult may present with very vague symptoms, they may just report weakness, fatigue, confusion, changes in appetite. They may be a febrile and not have a cough. Um, usually hypoxemia is present. The most common symptom of pneumonia in the older adult is a change in cognition with acute confusion, and that's due the, to the low oxygen levels, so you need to know that. You may have um, family members or the patient themselves question um, why you're pursuing a workup or why the provider is pursuing a workup for pneumonia in the presence of these vague symptoms, and you need to explain that older adults may not present with the characteristic symptoms we associate um, with the adult population. Their white count may not be as elevated until their infection is severe and therefore waiting to treat um, or waiting to intervene with diagnosis is increasing the risk of complications that they may experience. Next we'll talk about labs and imaging for diagnosis of pneumonia. Often a sputum sample will be ordered. This is examined with gram stain culture and sensitivity to help determine the organism responsible for the pneumonia infection. However, usually these samples, um, a few of them are contaminated and not able to truly identify the organ in, organism involved. You will see your patient um, demonstrate an elevated white blood cell count, except in that older adult population that we just discussed. Blood cultures may be performed to determine if the organism has entered the bloodstream. You may also see an ABG ordered. This is to determine um, the severity of the um, gas exchange impairment and help to determine if the patient needs supplemental oxygen in the best form of that oxygen delivery system. A BMP will be ordered to assess electrolytes, BUN, and creatinine levels. Patient may have an elevated BUN as a result of dehydration, also may have um, hypernatremia as a result 
of the dehydration, you may see a lactate level ordered. Um, this is to help providers assess for the presence of sepsis. Um, lactate is formed when your cells um, are doing work without the oxygen that they need. Um, elevated lactate levels can indicate the, um, the seriousness or presence of septic shock. Typically, um, lactate levels at or above four are considered high, but some um, facilities do use different cutoffs, so it may be of a value um, closer to two that they associate with septic shock. They may monitor the lactic acid to determine um, if the sepsis is progressing or improving. You will again um, see that in an older adult, there's um, a chest x-ray is essential for early diagnosis. As we just discussed, they may present with very vague symptoms and we need the um, chest x-ray to identify if a pneumonia is the reason for these changes. They again may be afebrile, mainly present with mental status changes or a fall and um, a cough may or may not be present. Next, we will discuss um, analyzing our cues and prioritizing hypothesis for our care of our patient. Priorities will be addressing decreased gas exchange due to decreased diffusion at the alveolar capillary membrane. There is potential for airway obstruction for our patients due to inflammation with excessive pulmonary secretions and muscle weakness. There's also the complication of sepsis due to the microorganisms um, involvement in our bloodstream and vascular area and reduced immunity and the potential for um, the spread of these infectious organisms from our lung into our pleural space. Next, we'll talk about generating solutions and taking action in the care of your patient who has pneumonia. Care will be focused on improving gas exchange these interventions will be similar to those we've already discussed for patients with non-infectious um, respiratory disorders, including asthma and COPD. Nursing priorities include delivery of oxygen therapy and, of course, assisting um, the patient with bronchial hygiene techniques. Oxygen therapy is typically delivered by nasal cannula or mask unless that hypoxemia does not seem to be improving with these low um, flow therapy devices you will be encouraging your patient to utilize their incentive spirometer to improve um, inspiratory muscle action and try to prevent or re reverse if already present um, the presence of atelectasis and again that's that alveolar, alveolar collapse so that is impairing our gas exchange. You want to instruct the patient um, to sit up if possible, exhale fully and then place that mouthpiece of the incentive spirometer in their mouth. They're going to take that long, slow, deep breath, and that's going to raise that ball or piston as high as possible. They want to hold their breath for two to four seconds before slowly exhaling. You want to teach them to perform this five to ten times per session at least every hour during um, awake times. Next priority will be preventing airway obstruction. Again, because of the fatigue, the muscle weakness, the chest discomfort, the excessive secretions from the fluid, the patient often has difficulty clearing these secretions, so we want to help them encourage their coughing and deep breathing at least every two hours. We want to encourage adequate hydration with two liters of fluid, um, and that again is to help thin out these secretions. Two liters of fluid um, is appropriate unless that patient is on fluid restrictions due to other comorbidities. Bronchiodilators are prescribed. This is to alleviate bronchiospasms. Steroids are used um, to help reduce inflammation and airway swelling. And then you may see Mucinex utilized with adequate hydration to help thin out secretions. Now preventing sepsis. Um, this is the role of our antibiotic therapy. There will typically be utilization of drugs and the route of the delivery of those drugs will be based on um, how we believe the patient was infected with the pathogen that has caused the pneumonia, whether that was um, a community-acquired pneumonia, um, healthcare-acquired pneumonia, how ill the patient is. Um, the organism involved will also play 
a role in selection of antibiotic therapy. Also, the patient's risk for complications due to comorbidities or reduced immunity. Now we will discuss care coordination and transition management. This is typically a long recovery phase for patients, especially older adults. That can be extremely frustrating. Um, the fatigue, weakness, and residual cough can last for weeks, and most patients fear they will not have this return to normal level of functioning. You want to be very encouraging of expectations and discuss um, energy conservation strategies. You want to emphasize the importance of completing their antibiotic therapy and instruct them to notify their provider if they note chills, fever, persistent cough, shortness of breath, wheezing, um, return or increased sputum production, chest discomfort or worsening fatigue, strategies to prevent um, additional infections or reoccurrences, teach them to avoid crowds, especially in the fall and winter months we know these viruses are more vigilant. And then also um, those who have um, a cold or flu making sure we avoid um, those contacts and also to irritants such as smoke. And then healthy choices related to our diet, rest, and aqua fluid intake are also important. Next we will discuss pulmonary tuberculosis which is caused by mycobacterium tuberculosis. Only a small per percentage of adults infected um, with TB will ever develop active disease. This is due to the normal protection of our immune system, preventing full development of this disease in a healthy person. However, those with immunosuppression, HIV infection, um, who currently smoke or have certain comorbidities are at higher risk for progression to active disease. Initial effects infection is seen more often in the upper lobes of the lungs. The local um, lymph nodes are infected and enlarged. This is an asymptomatic period um, that usually follows the primary infection. This asymptomatic period can last for years and decades before we will see clinical symptoms. At that point it would be termed latent TB. An infected person is not contagious to others. Um, until symptoms of disease occur. The risk for infection transmission is reduced significantly after an adult with active t TB has received proper drug therapy for two to three weeks and has also experienced clinical improvement in symptoms. In North America, the adults that are at greatest risk for the development of TB are those who are in constant frequent contact with an untreated infected person, so someone who has not received antibiotic therapy, those who have reduced immunity or current HIV infection, adults who live in crowded areas such as long-term care facilities, homeless shelters, older homeless adults, use of injection drugs or alcohol, lower socioeconomical status, and then foreign immigrants from less affluent countries. Recognizing cues. TB is considered for any patient with a persistent cough, um, also including an unintentional weight loss, anorexia, night sweat, shortness of breath, fever, or chills. There are some patients um, who may have received a BCG vaccine, often those living overseas in childhood, they will have a positive TB skin test if they've received this vaccine within the last 10 years, and that is because this vaccine is attenuated with the TB bacterium. These patients will have to be further evaluated with other diagnostics to determine if they have active disease or infection. Next, we will discuss the diagnostic assessment for TB. The one that most of us are probably most familiar with is the TB skin test. It is the most commonly used reliable screening for TB. With a skin test, a small amount of purified protein derivative, PPD, is placed intradermally in the forearm. This, chest, this test is then read 48 to 72 hours later 
to assess for an area of induration. This would be a localized area of swelling with hardness of the soft tissue, measuring 10 millimeters or greater in diameter. This does indicate exposure to and possible infection with TB. There is a figure 28.3 um, in your textbook that demonstrates a positive skin TB test. Now in adults with reduced immunity, an induration of five centimeters is actually considered a positive result. A positive reaction, again, is only indicating exposure to TB um, or the possible presence of an active or dormant disease, not active disease. A reduced skin reaction or a negative test does not rule out TB disease or infection of the very old or anyone who may have severe reduced immunity because that would um, compromise their ability to have a positive response. In these populations, typically um, a quantiferum TB gold will be ordered and this is where the patient's um, immune system responds to a TB bacterium, a positive result does mean that that person is infected with TB, but it does not indicate whether the infection is latent or active currently. Therefore, sputum cultures usually will confirm the diagnosis. Um, sputum cultures may also be utilized to determine the effectiveness of antibiotic treatment. There are annual screening recommenda recommendations for those who commonly may come into contact with people who may be infected with TB, including um, healthcare workers. I typically do receive um, one every, every year. Once um, a patient's skin test is positive for TB, they will also have a chest x-ray performed and that's to determine if there is active or old um, healed lesions. There is potential for airway obstruction due to thick secretions and weak cough effort. Also potential for development of drug resistant disease and spread of the infection. And this is due to um, inadequate adherence to the therapy regimen. And we'll talk further about that. It seems to be correlated due to the duration and length of therapy. Weight loss due to an adequate intake and also nausea and adverse effects from antibiotic therapy. Fatigue due to the lengthy presentation of the illness. Also due to the poor gas exchange at the alveolar capillary membrane and increased energy demands. Next we're going to talk about the management of TB and nursing interventions. I encourage you that if you've been skipping through slides or not paying close attention that you tune in here. We're going to promote airway clearance with our TB patients. Interventions to maintain a patient airway are similar to those for pneumonia and COPD that we've already discussed. You want to instruct your patient to drink plenty of fluids unless there's another comorbidity that's requiring a fluid restriction. Teach him or her to take deep breaths before coughing. We want to utilize an incentive spirometer to also facilitate effective coughing techniques. Next, we're gonna talk about reducing drug resistance and spread of infection. You want to be familiar with the first line therapy for non-resistant TB that's um, listed in box five um, on page 579. Usually it is a utilization of multi-antibiotic therapy for the first initial phase of treatment that usually lasts eight weeks. The patient will then continue another 18 weeks um, if they have been successful treatment in the first eight weeks and may continue to take rifampin um, either daily or twice a week. Some of these drugs are also used for shorter periods um, if it's for latent TB infections instead of active TB. Um, patients who remain um, culture positive after eight weeks or those who may have history of HIV and are not currently taking antiviral therapy, they may require longer um, treatment periods of up to seven months of continuous therapy. I encourage you to note the similarities in the nursing implications. 
under your TB um, drug therapy box. Remind patients to avoid alcoholic beverages while on the multi-drug regimen because the liver damaging effects of these drugs that are potentiated by alcohol. You want to teach your patient to report any darkening of urine, yellow appearance to skin or the whites of the eyes, an increased tendency to bruise or bleed, which are all signs and symptoms of liver toxicity or failure. The reason um, for the increased bruising or bleeding is indicative of liver injury as the liver synthesizes a lot of our clotting factors. We would typically see in our patients who have liver injury prolonged PT and INR. Let's remember that normal INR is 1.3 to 2 and normal PT range is 11 to 15 seconds. Also highlight the drug alert box on 578. This is reminding you again that the first line drugs used as therapy for TB all can damage the liver. Continue to advise you to warn your patient to not drink any alcoholic beverages for the entire duration of TB treatment. You want to encourage strict adherence to the prescribed drug regimen. This is important for eradicating and suppressing the disease. Adherence can be difficult due to the long duration of treatment. You may have patients who are hospitalized with active TB. In a hospital, hospital setting, they are placed on airborne precautions in a well-ventilated room with at least six exchanges of fresh air per minute. Um, all healthcare um, workers do wear a, a respirator during airborne precautions. Typically, these precautions are discontinued when the patient is no longer contagious. You want to talk with your patient about infection prevention strategies, um, what to do about disease monitoring, and how to conserve energy for participating in activities. Because TB, if typically treated outside the acute care setting um, with the patient at home, airborne precautions are not necessary with treatment at home because these family members have already been exposed. You may have family members express concerns um, about the disease process, um, their possibility of infection, um, treatment for them, or if um, they're visiting their family member in the hospital setting on airborne precautions. You want to ensure you're using therapeutic communication techniques and asking um, what their specific fears are so that you can help address their concerns. We're going to focus on nutrition for our patients with TB. Make sure they have a diet rich in protein, iron, and vitamins. You want to educate him or her um, that a dietitian may be helpful. And continue to avoid alcohol um, with their medication regimen. Now we're going to talk about rhinosinusitis. This can be due to anything really that would impair sinus drainage. Um, Non-infectious causes include deviated nasal septum, um, facial trauma, nasal polyps, um, inhalation of air pollutants or allergens, and even a dental infection. When this problem is not due to infectious source, um, it is blocking um, the flow of sinus drainage, the inflammation is preventing um, also the flow of secretion, so therefore um, you do have the perfect environment for a virus or bacteria to cause an, an infection. So just because you have a non-infectious source initially does not mean it cannot um, prelude you to then having a virus or bacterial infection. Um, most episodes of rhinosinusitis are due to a virus infection. It's very important that we educate our patients on um, virus infections and that they do not require antibiotic therapy. Complications in for rhinosinusitis include cellulitis, abscess, and meningitis. Um, drug therapy will include decongestants, antihistamines, and intranasal steroids to block or reduce the amount of chemical mediators in your um, nasal and sinus tissues, which is going to help relieve that inflammation that's preventing sinus drainage. Antipyretics are given for fever and usually analgesics for pain. They want you to pay close attention to the adult, older adult consideration box on 581. 
first generation antihistamines, for example, Benadryl or diphenhydramine, may not be an appropriate drug for your older adults. These patients often have reduced drug clearance, um, so therefore they're at higher risk for adverse effects of first generation antihistamines, including side effects of confusion, um, also anticholinergic effects of dry mouth and constipation, sedation, tachycardia, hypotension. So we will commonly avoid this cate category, um, cate category of drugs. And you want to teach your older adult um, why, we sh why they should not self-medicate with these because again, these are available over the counter. You want to instruct your patient, and this is your nursing safety priority box on 581, the importance of completing the entire course of medication. Even if they all their symptoms resolve, they should complete the course. There is significant risk for reoccurrence and drug resistance when therapy is not completed as prescribed. Now we will move on to peritonsillar abscess. This is typically a complication of acute bacterial tonsillitis. Infection spreads from the tonsil to the surrounding tissues and then therefore forms an abscess that actually can become large enough to obstruct an airway. Most patients um, can be treated as outpatients with antibiotics, although some may need um, steroids in addition to to help reduce the pain. Stra um, drainage also of the abscess may be needed I encountered this once in um, an urgent care setting and it was significantly obstructive to their airway so much so they were having trouble um, producing sound. Their voice was very hoarse um, and we did urgently send them over to the ER where they had it drained. Signs and symptoms for these patients is going to include um, presence of pulse uh, behind their tonsil. Usually they were reporting throat pain, fever, difficulty swallowing, um, and also have swollen lip nodes. When antibiotic treatment is prescribed, again, you need to stress the importance of completing the entire antibiotic regimen. Um, again, the risk here is that there could be resistance or not successful treatment. You also want to advise them that if they begin to experience symptoms of airway obstruction, if this is a patient that was trying to be managed at home, that they come to the ER immediately if they're experiencing drooling or stridor. Okay. And the patient, if this is persistent or a significant abscess, there may be recommendation after resolution of the acute infection to have a tonsillectomy. Inhalation anthrax. It is a bacterial infection that is um, received from contaminated soil, has a 100% fatality rate um, if infection occurs in the lungs and is left untreated. There are two stages that um, patients typically present with that we will discuss, and we'll talk about the antibiotic used um, to treat these infections. Because of the lethalness of this inhalation anthrax, if it um, occurs in an adult that does not have a, ex, a hazard, a occupational hazard such as veterinarians or a farmer to come in contact with this bacteria from the soil, it is considered an intentional act of bioterrorism. The active bacteria of inhalation anthrax will produce toxins that are released into the infected tissues of the lungs and into the blood, which is therefore going to increase um, the risk of making this infection worse and proceeding to sepsis and meningitis. There is massive edema occurring with hemorrhaging of tissue and disruption of lung cells. Usually the infected white blood cells then further spread um, the pathogen into lymph nodes and blood. These lethal toxins produced by the bac bacteria are the most common cause um, of death from inhalation anthrax. Again, there's two stages. There's this incubation period and then the active disease period. You do need to be familiar um, with all the symptoms that are listed in the key features box of this inhalation anthrax section. It may take up to eight weeks 
um, after exposure for these symptoms to be present. So let's talk about if you were in a situation of trying to prioritize care um, for um, community members during a biohazard drill for inhalation anthrax. I can imagine this being a very um, overwhelming situation for emergency and personnel first responders. The key to prioritization, again, is always the ABCs. So you would be prioritizing your patients who've had um, possible exposure to inhalation anthrax and are demonstrating airway breathing impairment, um, such as hypoxia or stridor. Now with the two phases, that first um, phase usually is just gonna seem like flu-like symptoms, but there is a key feature um, that you can utilize to differentiate inhalation anthrax and upper respiratory symptoms. Usually in inhalation anthrax is not accompanied by rhinitis and sore throat. With this stage, the um, patient usually starts to feel better in two to four days, and then the active stage occurs as they're feeling better and then they may have a sudden onset of severe disease including respiratory distress, bloody vomit, shortness of breath, diaphoresis, stridor, chest pain, and cyanosis. Unfortunately, death often occurs within 20 to 24 to 36 hours um, after these symptoms began even if antibiotics were started in this stage. Antibiotics commonly used to treat inhalation anthrax or are Cipro, doxycycline, amoxicillin, clindamycin, and vancomycin. You also may see one or more of these drugs used in, to treat pre to prevent illness when there is concern for exposure um, to inhalation anthrax, but they are not currently demonstrating symptoms. You do want to teach patients with any lower respiratory infection to watch for sudden changes or worsening of their symptoms after they think they're getting well, and they need to seek emergency medical attention if this occurs. There are a variety of resp respiratory infections that are isolated due to their geological um, location, meaning that that causative organism is most common in that area. The um, incident of infection in those areas are usually low, and that's because adults living in these areas often have developed some immunity to the organism due to exposure over time and usually um, only developed that particular infection if they came into contact with a large number um, of pathogens or if they have a se severely reduced immune system. These organisms are, or pathogens are commonly a part of the normal environment in this um, geographic location. Um, healthy adults are most susceptible to infection, again, with those intense exposures such as for like soil-borne organisms. If you have adults who are farmers or digging the soil, working construction where there's disturbance of soil, they can be heavily exposed and then develop um, symptoms of infection or maybe they're exposed during um, natural disasters such as tornadoes, floods, um, or dust storms. Typically these respiratory infections will resemble influenza and pneumonia with fever, cough, headache, muscle aches, chest pain, night sweats, and be misdiagnosed for those reasons. Identification of the specific organism is very important so that treatment can be specific um, to the organism and also prevent the complications that can occur. I want you to know um, with the geographical um, respiratory infections that you make sure um, you prioritize asking your patient who present with respiratory symptoms if they've um, what their travel history is if they've um, visited any possible places that we know to have um, sources of these pathogens kind of expected courses and then we also want to kind of educate them on appropriate management strategies Supportive care is um, typically um, similar to what we've already discussed with influenza and pneumonia once we've identified the organism.